Excellent. Hi, Mike. Hi. <laughs> How, How are, are you? you? I'm great. Uh, I'm sorry to hear you were sick. Yeah, I'm I'm on the tail end of COVID. Uh, Finally got me. Did you so. get the uh, the brain goop like I did? Yeah, the brain fog. That uh, you just frog. Cannot get through. Yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it hit me a lot harder than I expected it to. Yeah, I, I kept hearing how mild everybody was was having it. And I, I did not have that experience at all. Oh, I got it. Uh, I was I tested positive on New Year's Day and was out for uh, two. I watched all of Will and Grace while I had COVID. It's an <laughs> impressive feat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so um, let's get started. Hey, everyone. Um, this is Jess. I am so excited to introduce um, a special guest. I know I've kind of hinted at it, but I truly didn't believe it would happen until I actually saw his face pop up. Um, this is Mike Flanagan is joining us, director, writer of, boy, oh boy, Haunting Hill House, Haunting a Blind Manor, uh, Midnight Mass. Uh, what's the one where she's locked? Uh, Gerald's Game. Gerald's Game. Thank you. That one messed me up. I <laughs> actually met uh, Carol. I cannot think of his last name. Uh, the, the Carl Stryker. Stryker. Yeah. He, mm -hmm. we met him at a um, Twin Peaks fest because we're extremely cool people. And I was like, sir, I just want to let you know, like you ruined me for like two weeks. And he did not think that was funny or entertaining. So anyway, um, uh -huh. so Mike, I reached out to you because I wanted to speak um, specifically about, I mean, I love your work, especially, I, I think I really wanted to have a midnight mass for obvious reasons. Um, but the thing that caught my interest was the fact that you uh, dig into sobriety and specifically AA. And you do that in a few of your things. And if I am um, speaking on turn, I could be wrong. Did Hill House come out before you were sober? Yes, it did. Okay. So that was, I think, what grabbed me. So you had an interest in the 12-step program, even as somebody who was not participating in it? Yes. Well, well I think an interest is a... Uh is is one word for it i think it mean <laughs> would, would be another word for it um yeah i you know i i flirted with recovery for years mm. before before i finally was able to get serious about it um and so i'd been to i'd been to aa meetings um prior to hill house mm. uh, and had always said up oh, i i don't i don't think i'm i i really need this i don't think i belong here uh -huh. um and and yeah but i i got sober Kind of right around the time that Hill House was released. Oh, okay. So, so was there a reason that there was something that drew you to the program, like just well, to use it as a storytelling device? I mean, I guess the steps sort of really help you. Like, okay, he's on this step, so he's motivated to do this thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, um, it's something I'd, I'd always been kind of tangentially aware of in my life because mm -hmm. there, there are people in my extended family, uh, some of whom have been, you know, recovered for decades now and and who really uh believe in aa and stephen king's a big hero of mine who's mm -hmm. been sober now for more yeah. than 30 years and 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 roger ebert was a major hero of mine mm -hmm. uh who writes beautifully about his experiences with aa yeah um so i was always interested in it and and i was very interested in in the different ways people can approach recovery mm -hmm. and kind of take control over over their lives um, it's interesting because AA didn't didn't really work for me. Yeah. It never did, and and um, I got way more interested in rational recovery, and and that kind of you know spilled over into Midnight Mass quite a bit, which I think you you had mentioned. You, yes. You, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it's it's something that's always been in my orbit, and um, I think I when I was younger. <laughs> I was, you know, I, I was, I don't want to say like an AA tourist, but I, I would hit, I would hit these, these little bumps that weren't quite rock bottom for me. Uh -huh. And they, it would be, it would scare me enough to send me to a meeting though. And, sure. and I would kind of take it in and I'd look around and there were things about it that bugged me. And, mm -hmm. um, but then it was also about, in a lot of ways for me, it was like, whatever works whatever you know works for for anyone in 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 their given situation is yeah. something that i want to support mm -hmm. so it was it was always kind of back and forth but um i didn't realize how fascinated i was with it in my work mm. until i got sober and kind of looked back and was, oh wow i've been 
<laughs> I've been walking up to the line of, of this for years. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware of it. And was, was Dr. Sleep before or after Hill House? That was after Hill House. After Hill House. Okay. Because that certainly has the sobriety angle, but it's sort of built into the story. That's that's obviously not like a little thing you you added in. And yeah, it's it's interesting. My I have family members, like you said, who have been to AA and I've gone to, you know, the Al Anon meetings. And most of my, you know, the three people I can think of who are sober are all atheists. And we're like, okay, so the first step is like, let go and let God, I guess, which is no, thank you. That's not part of my intro. Like, do you think the fact that it's rooted in religion is inherently harmful? Or do you think, because they do a lot of playing of like, what's a higher power to you? It could be the universe or right. whatever. Do you have any thoughts on why it's LinkedIn? You know, I, I think my read of it, and, and, and I'm not an expert mm -hmm. in the program, my read of it was that Christianity was, was very much kind of interwoven into the fabric of the program. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right that there was a lot, because that was what I objected to. That was where I, that was the wall I always hit on the way in the door. Yeah. Was the higher power. And, and the, 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 the striking similarities I found between my experience at a meeting and my experience at a Catholic mass. Um, mm -hmm. the ritual, the repetition, mm -hmm. the prayer, the kind of the proselytization, the, the confession aspect oh my god i never connected the confession aspect yeah oh that's it, good uh, it, there, there were a lot of elements that kind of where i where i was looking for kind of guidance and 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 comfort managing you know my alcoholism uh -huh. i was i was kind of pulled back into some of the less comfortable elements of my childhood which sure was, and just kind of like oh man here we are again huh um and and so that was you know you're kind of identifying the biggest issue i had and sure. and there was a lot of talk about well time can be your higher power or mm. your family can be your higher power and and it didn't it didn't get me over the line yeah it, it was just kind of like i i don't know i just feel like for me it it <laughs> it felt disingenuous for me to put yeah well and if you say, oh, my family is my higher power, then what? Then yeah. everything they say is truth or I don't like it, what No, I was expecting them to do this yeah, for exactly, me. Yeah, you know, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it very much for me, I, I was like, what I'm looking for in this equation is personal accountability. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I need to figure out a way to empower myself to take responsibility mm -hmm. for my own actions and not, and that was the thing I kept kind of kicking against was not give it give it to someone else or put it on something else yeah but just, no, I, I did this yes and and I am responsible for the daily decision mm -hmm. to change um and you know it's it yeah so so it <laughs> it always felt like I was um whenever I'd get to the the recitation and and in the prayers and everything else I, I always I could tell that I was lying mm-hmm and I was like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to be able to do this for real if I'm lying. Yeah. To yeah. To someone else, I, you know. Well, because if you can't be um, honest with yourself from the get go, then like, what's the point of any of this? Yeah. It, it's it's like, if, if the whole point of this is to really rip away, mm -hmm. you know, uh, rip away these layers to get to kind of the truth of, of myself and, yeah. and really affect legitimate and hopefully kind of permanent change in my life mm -hmm. I can't build that on a lie mm -hmm. um, no matter how well intentioned that lie might be I have caught myself lying to my therapist and then been like wait stop hold on this is what are we doing here yeah. why am I making stuff up to tell you of all people <laughs> yeah it's like you want them to you want them to look at you a certain way oh my god and and, and, and it's like well what that this is the definition of counterproductive now oh hundred percent i just will please your way through therapy so yeah i truly yeah. when i was i told the therapist about this i'm like i just really want him to like me and she's like just that's wh <laughs> why why though like why does it matter <laughs> uh, 
Oh, also, my friend wants to know if Kate wants to be our best friend. That was the first thing. <laughs> like, literally, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to interview Mike Flanagan. She's like, ask if Kate will hang out with us. I think she'd like us. <laughs> uh, I bet she would. I, I, I seriously bet she would. And she's out right now. She might be back before we're done. So if she is, I'll have her come in. I would love to say um, hi. She's so great. I guess you know that because you oh, are married to her and work with her. She's pretty good she is, at what she does. She's the greatest person in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Kate, too. You know, Kate's sober. Um, Kate's oh. uh, uh, got powerful ideas about the universe and, and uh -huh. about, you know, science and religion and everything. I think you guys would actually get along very well. So, yeah, you should definitely, you should get Kate on there. Yes. Yes, I should. Great. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so um, let's talk about uh, Midnight Mass and the Catholicism of it all. So you grew up Catholic. Is that what you, you mentioned? I okay. Yeah, I, I was I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy oh. for over a decade. Um, so yeah, serving Mass every Sunday and, and I did the whole the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was, con yeah, confirmed all, all, all good to go. Um, until I, uh, I I got to college. I was just going to say you went to college, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> yep, I, I I I find myself in in a in a public university uh -huh. uh, for college, and it took about a semester for me to kind of go, oh shit. <laughs> um, and and I took a uh, well, I one of the things that occurred to me was that um, I would get into conversations with friends. Because um, I was meeting people from different backgrounds for the first time mm -hmm. in my adult life. I, I went to Catholic grade school. I went to Catholic high school. Oh, okay. You were deep into yeah. it. You weren't it's, just it's, like every Sunday. This is. Oh, yeah. Every day. Uh -huh. You know, every Ugh. day. I mean, we had we had confession as part of our curriculum. No. In high school. Ew. Yeah. We were you honest? Day. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> No way. No. And, and that was some of the stuff that, that first kind of, when I, when I started to kind of look around and realize how kind of fucked up everything was starting to feel was uh -huh. high school, when it was like this line of teenage boys going into confession. And it was just like, we're not, we're not really talking about it. <laughs> we're not talking, we're not talking about everything. Like you're all in agreement. Like we're all going to yeah, be cool like about this. Yeah. It's like, we're not, we're not going to say everything. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and so it was, uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I um I got to this point where I was I got into an argument with uh with a kid that I'd met in, in school. Um and it was like a drunken like party argument, philosophical argument. Sure. You know, yeah. I was on the I was on the alcohol and and they were getting high and we uh. were talking about life. <laughs> and um <coughs> and they kind of challenged me about the Bible. Mm. And it occurred to me that my knowledge of the Bible was entirely based on what had been curated for me and read to me uh, throughout my Catholic education, but that I'd never read it. Well, that's the interesting thing about Catholicism is they're like, no, 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 don't read it. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't look. It's so boring. You we'll won't tell like you. It. We'll tell you what's important. Yeah, we'll tell you. Believe me. Yeah. I, I always think that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's. And I did, I, well, I did the crazy thing, which is like, oh, all right, I'm going to read, then I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sat and read it and I was like, what, what, <laughs> like, what, what is this? Did and, you get and... thrown off by the fact that there are two creation stories just right off the bat? Yeah. Just right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. It was like the end of Clue. It was like, <laughs> that's, that's how it could have happened. Or. But how about like, this? Yeah. How about this one? The and, kingdom and... of heaven is near. <laughs> well, and there was so much in particular in the old testament that i was completely ignorant of mm -hmm. and, and and reading that was shocking mm -hmm. um and there were there were issues i'd had growing up about some old testament stories that that had always kind of horrified me <laughs> <laughs> and but but it was totally acceptable and and i remember that one of the first ones for me was passover you know mm -hmm. when it was like yes and then and because we put the right blood on the doors god killed everyone else's babies and i was like what cool good job god <laughs> um and it but things like that had always kind of echoed in my head but i hadn't really given them any real critical thought mm -hmm. and so I, I i read the book i put it down and was like this is this is an anthology collection of yeah 
iron age philosophy Mm -hmm. from you know what i what i feel like is hundreds of individual writers yes. none of whom are, are coordinating yes right? i agree with and those those thoughts it's, it's a mess and that radically destabilized me mm. um, destabilized so I, you is an interesting word to use did you did you feel like you were relying a lot on your faith well it, i felt like i my understanding of what the world was um was kind of upended Mm-hmm. And, and that my my parents who you know remain devout catholics and and my teachers mm-hmm. and all my friends you know mm-hmm. I, I wanted to go to everybody one at a time and be like have you have you read this <laughs> um, but have you actually <laughs> read this? this whole like guys i think this is embarrassing for all of us <laughs> um <laughs> and when i when i did they, they, they find they, out what's in here they're gonna uh, laugh us out of congress <laughs> like, we, we gotta be real careful because people read this we're gonna we're gonna look really we need really... to get back to latin you guys like, yeah <laughs> um vatican II and... was a mistake <laughs> yeah, yes it's, this really needs just just lock it back up and, um more gowns for people that's what that's that'll distract them yeah it's it's but the music was so good um yeah the um the so then I took a world religion class, and then all bets were off like at that point. Sure. Um, and so then I said, uh, <laughs> if I'm because my parents freaked out, they were not happy. Um, and I said, well, if I'm going to look for God, then I need to look everywhere, and I want to I want to read as much as I can. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I want to I want to read the Tao Te Ching. I I want to read the Quran. Mm-hmm. I I want to read the Talmud. Like, was worried I, I, just you. Was the character worried just literally you? Yes. That's okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. I guess I should have connected those dots much faster. Um, <laughs> but I'm here now. I'm with you. I understand. <laughs> yeah, the midnight mass is. I was like, is why um, does this sound familiar? It's yeah. It's it's a very <laughs> poorly disguised um, avatar. Well, you fooled me. me. So you fooled some idiots. <laughs> um, but I, I saw that. I, I it, it really like everything you see in the show is is true, except thankfully for the the prison know, it, DUI. But yeah, um, Mike. Oh my God, the opening. Sorry, the opening shot of the Jesus fish and the lights. Holy shit! You are so good at what you do. It is. Ju- I was just like grabbed immediately. It was incredible. Also, I love that anytime anybody's in Chicago. They always crash right by the shed aquarium, so they have that nice <laughs> Chicago view when they crash. <laughs> well, they should really just put up a sign. They yeah, really should. Um... It's very dangerous. <laughs> um, oh, that's funny. I um, <coughs> but and I'm, apologies for the coughs. I'm still uh, well, you still have a, a plague. So riding out the plague, but um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I I so I did my my big journey. I did five or six years of religious studies. And I came out of it an atheist, and wow. um, and it it I I kind of burned through all that reading and and, and explored as many <laughs> as many religions as I could kind of consume, mm-hmm. and then somewhere along the way, I picked up um, it was Letter to a Christian Nation at Sam Harris. First. Sure, yeah. Um, then End of Faith, and then Chris Hitchens mm-hmm. and Austin and. and and just kind of that is all of a sudden when it started to really make sense. Yeah, that was a, a path many, many, many people took is like, oh, this doesn't make sense. Oh, I read it. Uh oh. <laughs> like, has everybody yeah. else read this? I know. It was yeah, come on. Guys, we gotta we gotta talk about it. It but, um, really is is baffling that it's like with a straight face. You're like, every word, yeah, every single one, all of the words are true and derived from God. Okay, it's a bad book then. <laughs> like he's yeah. a bad author. <laughs> well, and and like especially you know especially the the Old Testament God because he changes so mm. radically. Sometimes but, he's vengeful. Sometimes yeah. he's loving. Well, he's a you know he's a straight up psycho. Sure. In, in, in book one. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, like like psycho. Bad guy. Bad guy. And, and then and then in in the New Testament they're like never mind. He's chill. He changed. Yeah, and it's like, I, I don't buy that he changed. I, I just don't. Age yeah. mellows everybody out, including gods. It's just yeah. a fact of life. Um, I actually just quickly want to get back to the fact that you said, I still love religious music so much. I was a choir kid growing up and near my God to me, I was like, hell yeah, I love this shit. Like 
I love choir music so much. <laughs> and the few times it popped up, I was like, yeah, Mike gets it. <laughs> oh, choir I, music. I, it's gorgeous. Oh and, and my God. That's the that's the thing I I've, you know, there there are elements, I think, in any religious ritual mm -hmm. that are beautiful. Sure. And 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 that's part of I think what lends it its majesty and and where it can it can hold people's hearts you know mm -hmm. and and I have a a profound nostalgia for a lot of that and mm -hmm. so the, when we were doing the music for Midnight Mass, um, I actually got to sing on on the tracks because I really? was really too yeah, um and so I went in and got to record you know I I got to sing on Nearer My God to the <gasps> and, um there's something. And there were other people on the crew and even among our composers who had been raised Catholic and were no longer religious, um, but we all knew all the words. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then it, it was, you know, this little moment of connection of like, oh yeah, you too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh boy. Well, been yeah. there. Um, Such a sucker for it. It's yeah. cause it's like so emotionally manipulative and it's like, yeah, I'll take this journey with you music. <laughs> no, it's, it's gorgeous. And yeah. I still, you know, it, it was tough not to lean into it. <laughs> you know, I, I had wanted, I had this big thing for, for the show where I didn't want any music that wasn't um, Catholic hymns. Sure. And to let it be kind of neutral. Mm. Um, but they don't play that way. They, they don't play neutral at all. <laughs> and um, I had wanted for Aaron's big monologue at the end, mm -hmm. which is, it's about a four minute monologue about, you know, a, a very, I think, non-catholic explanation for what what happens so what happens when you die yeah um i wanted that to be Oof. silent i wanted just the sounds of mm. birds and the fire and the wind and the sunrise and just just the sounds of nature mm -hmm. um but the problem was my composers um put a <laughs> instrumental version of were you there under it what's and that? it's it's another oh, that's what, what's in that yeah. yeah yeah and um and it had me just sobbing and and I, I emailed them afterwards and I was like, fuck you guys. Like I wanted, <laughs> I really didn't want to underscore that moment <laughs> with this kind of traditional ode to Catholicism, but it mm. it was so beautiful. <laughs> so we ended up leaving it. Oh um, funny. And that, that happened to me throughout the show where it was just kind of like, yeah, I the music is too emotionally resonant for me mm. to to get away from it. Yeah, I um God, that that whole scene. I actually had a miscarriage like immediately before that oh, I'm sorry. that episode came out. And my friend texted me, she's like, okay, just you have to be careful around episode whatever it was. And I was like, okay, they, like appreciated. But boy, oh boy, that that monologue she gives. Golly. Oof. I that gets me every time. Um sorry. anyway, no, it's <laughs> it is what it is. Um how did people respond to Midnight Mass who were of a Catholic stripe? They don't um, love being made fun of or well, questioned. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me because um, the reactions have run the gamut. Mm. Um, to my utter shock, my parents really loved the show. Really? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, was, I was bracing for, for it to be a family scandal. <laughs> um christmas is gonna they, suck no it was like this is gonna be really awkward but they really re they really loved it um i've read um passionate defenses of the show written by catholic priests um who say that a lot of the messaging in the show is is a necessary wake-up call for the church today mm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> i i wasn't expecting that um Excuse me, my God, yeah, I'm sorry. It's all right. Um, but uh, very, very interestingly, um, the response from atheists was also very mixed. Really? Yeah, and and huh. one of the <laughs> one of the the kind of harshest critiques that I read of the show is from an atheist who is saying, "This is um, this is espousing uh, a pro religious message," and I was like, "I." I are I'm on you your team. Sure? I, 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 yeah, I, I, I was like, I think you, you're misunderstanding it. Cl turn on subtitles next time you watch it. You missed something, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, 
but it, what, what's interesting is that I didn't want <coughs> I didn't want the show to be critical of the concept of fate and so and I would argue it's not at all yeah I I, I felt at the end that it was about you know <coughs> um, our propensity for for faith in each other mm -hmm. um, and faith in you know, in light, in a world mm -hmm. of darkness kind of thing. What, and, and not to sound like AA, but whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and and so I, I didn't want to make a show that was lambasting the concept of faith. Mm -hmm. I was surprised by how easily people could take the show and make it fit with whatever their current belief system was. So that I, I saw there were some very... <laughs> very religious people who said yep and the show agrees with me mm -hmm. it ends on a, on a message of of religious faith yeah um and it was it was wonderfully interesting to say you know that wasn't my intention mm -hmm. but that's what the viewer kind of that particular viewer got out of it um and so yeah the, the reactions really ran the full spectrum and mm -hmm. i found them all to be very interesting um, people have their own personal experience with the show. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd always thought that they'd have one similar to the one I had working on it and writing it, mm -hmm. um, but that isn't true. Yeah. And I think that's kind of awesome too. So, yeah. Well, there's an element as an artist of you can make your thing and you can put it out into the world and then it's the world's like the world gets to consume it however it however it wants to um which i think has to be the hardest part about being an artist of like you want to go back like no 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 you got it wrong you got it wrong but like yeah. you know it's all valid <laughs> you know analyzing a piece of art is all valid i saw it as not anti-faith at all especially when you looked at like the way uh the sheriff and his son ended like I don't know how you could look at that and be like, yeah, boo face. Like, that's terrible. I did love Bev trying to dig into the sand. That... <laughs> Golly, what a character Bev was. What an all timer. Yeah, Bev, when when I started kind of dreaming of Bev, uh -huh. um, when I started working on the script for this, which is like more than a decade ago, oh, I, I worried at a time that Bev would ring untrue and now i'm like oh my god no i mean we've got we've got bevs in congress yeah we've got bevs on tv every day like bev is actually relatively restrained compared to some of the actual a hundred personalities that are out there um <laughs> i i love her character i do too from a, a writing perspective she was so much fun to write mm. she really you know most of my opinions about organized religion are contained in in her mm -hmm. um but uh you know people I, I remember having to talk to netflix and they'd say you know well we have to build up to the real monster of the story meaning the, the yeah winged vampire and i was like no the real monster of the story is Bev. um you know that that can't be reassuring that netflix can't even identify the villain of a story oh they well they in in their you know in in what what defense I will give them on that, we kind of you know they were expecting a show about vampires, and sure. so they sure. as, as <laughs> it clearly that. was about yeah it's not that and and so there was a lot of yeah we'll get to the we'll get to the vampires, um, and I think there's a little bit toward the end of them being like seems like we're talking an awful lot about religion and recovery and it's like, oh yeah well, yeah forward. weird wait till it's edited wait till it's edited yeah you'll see it's got wings <laughs> um and uh and i used to tell them that you know the vampire is 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 just fanaticism you know it's yeah. it's it doesn't have a personality it's just basic it mm -hmm. It, it, it's, it's only life yeah. goal is to perpetuate itself yeah it, it it propagates itself it eats and it exists and it takes advantage of of whatever situation i was like the the things that make it monstrous are the people and how they use it right and and that's what bev i think and sam sloyan who who plays bev who's a dear dear friend of mine um and is actually the nicest like sweetest kindest person in the world who is forever kind of 
um, tainted by this character. Truly. Uh, she also had one of my favorite monologues. It, sorry, Zoom is telling me it's about to cut off my thing because oh, I no. didn't pay for it. Hold on, Zoom. I'll get you your money, bastard. Subscription. You have to pay like by the minute for Zoom? Well, it gave me, I think, a half hour for free. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like pay the piper oh geez i'm sorry it's not your fault i can pay the 12 dollars. not to brag um <laughs> this is gonna be personal use i'm so sorry how professional is this no it's okay i'm i'm coughing all over your podcast i feel terrible about that so. the step except just give me okay cool okay um Actually, while I'm doing this, did you know uh, the Music Box in Chicago? They're having a double feature of um, The Shining and Dr. Sleep. I did know that. Um, they actually asked me if I could go. And you should. We're going. I really, I really wanted to, uh, but between between the COVID and um, sure, I've got to, sure, sure. uh, I've got to, I've just lost two weeks of work on House of Usher, so I have to go. Oh uh, shit! Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I'm excited about House of Usher. I was really banking on somebody doing a, um, okay, complete your purchase, a um, uh, mask, shit, what's it called? Damn it, Jessica, think of the word. Um, something about, Mask of Red Death, got it. Oh, uh, I have good news for you. So. Really? Are you doing like a Poe thing? Yeah, so it's, our, our House of Usher is, you know, House of Usher, the story eats up about a half hour. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not a long one. It's not a long story. So <laughs> in between that, you know, the, the series is basically, it's a ton of Poe. There's so many different, and it's all kind of woven together. Yeah. Into one story, but it's it's all in there. And, oh, and good. Our Mask of the Red Death is crazy. Um, Excellent. Yeah. I just feel like it's so not on the nose but like oh, for yeah. what's going on right now it's pretty it's entirely on the nose <laughs> okay. yeah. i didn't want it to be an insult but i heard myself yeah. saying oh, it's, it it's so appropriate <laughs> yeah for what is happening right now it truly is okay we got it all right now i own this zoom well done <laughs> all right that timer is off okay um what i was gonna say is uh, uh what'd you say the actress who plays bev is sam sam sam, sam. sloan yeah. The actually genuinely one of my favorite. I really love, and I'm sorry, I'm getting off atheism. I just want to talk to you about your work. Um, I love Dream Logic. I my husband and I are big David Lynch fans. Um, oh yeah. And so Dream Logic is just one of my favorite things in the world. And when and, and I think personally, like David Lynch just is so good at capturing that Dream Logic. And my favorite example, though, is in her monologue at the end of House and Haunted Hill, when all of a sudden he, she is like, he's like, I don't remember how I got here. I don't remember leaving it. And that is so, oh my God, it was just the reveal of it of like, I don't remember how I got here. I don't remember you getting pregnant. I don't remember. I was like, this is the best. I, it blew me away. It's truly such a remarkable moment of like oh 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 my god oh my god this is what's happening oh i loved it boy i love oh, that show sam just crushed that monologue too. so good well she had to you know and i was like digitally we're gonna just i forgot awful. about the end yeah. of it yeah she, <laughs> she goes through this horrible yeah. um so poor sam i've i really i've so you know i i the first time i worked with sam we stabbed her like 20 times against a door and hush. Oh, and hush. Yes. Um, and she was a good sport about that. And then she came to do Haunting Hill House and, and we had her explode like a like a tick. Mm -hmm. um, and then Midnight Mass. Uh, and then, you know, she she goes through quite a lot in, in the Father House of Usher, too. But um, oh, poor lady. <laughs> yeah, she's she's so great. And um, she really she embodies for me so much of kind of the most toxic mm. religious, you know, um, attitude, I think. And, and the contempt with yeah. which she kind of holds everyone else. And, and um, 
Sam, I remember when we were going through it and kind of prepping the character, she'd be like, you have to tell me if I've gone too far, it starts to feel maniacal. And I was uh -huh. like, I, I swear to God, I think there are states in this, in this country, you'd be easily elected mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. the way you're playing her. I, I really think that's the way it is. But, I uh, would love a prequel about her because the other aspect that's only kind of hinted at and sort of like brushed off is the sort of like, she's the reason that we're broke. She grabbed this money and built this rec center when all of a sudden everybody noticed. Like, I love to hear about a petty tyrant, somebody who just like grabs onto the tiniest bit of control and goes ape shit with it. And those are my favorite villains of just the crate. Cause I think whether or not, whether it was religion or whatever, she would have found something to be in control of. She yeah. would be a leader somehow. And she, it's, you know, she kept deferring to, Oh, the old, the old preacher says this, it's fine. You can trust me. It's diabolical and just such an interesting situation to watch. Like how, if, somebody calls her an asshole at the end or something like that. And it's so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I know there, there was a lot of wish fulfillment at the end. And, and <laughs> at the, um, I remember in the writer's room when we would talk about the last few seconds of the show and, mm -hmm. and kind of how everyone would meet their, their death, you know, mm -hmm. how, how everybody in that last moment would, would respond and how, you know, we we had all these ideas of of community and and of reflection and um and unanimously we were all like everybody can have these different kind of healthy expressions of of it except for Bev mm -hmm. she needs to be trying to bury herself in the sand like a crab yeah like that is the only that is the only appropriate ending for her um and uh, and I remember filming that we built this giant sandbox on a stage because we had to you know do the the sunrise uh, the sunrise digitally oh, against uh -huh. the screen and so Samantha's kneeling there in this giant sandbox wind in her face staring at a blue screen and just the <laughs> the full commitment to that profound cowardice yeah um, yes i just cuz i i just in my in in my heart of hearts i believe that some of the loudest people who claim to have, you know, the sword of God in their mm -hmm. hand in that moment, they're digging in the sand. Like, I, I, I just believe it. I mean, it's a Ted Cruz going to Cancun during, like, yeah. it's the same thing. No, it's, it's Holly running through, you know, running yeah. through Congress Yeah. Ugh. on oh. January 6th. It looks like the Catch Me If You Can poster. <laughs> like, just it's, sprinting. Yeah, just he's a blur. Um, yeah, that you know, I, I I find that the there's a there is this correlation between how aggressively loud people mm -hmm. can be, especially hateful people, mm -hmm. um, and the degree to which they're deeply scared. Yeah, you know, it. and and yeah, I don't know. In DC, <laughs> it is a fear of just change, the loss of power. Yeah, I I kind of feel like so so to 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 need to have power over other people, mm -hmm, right? To, mm -hmm. to have this kind of unquenchable need to assert yourself over someone else. Mm -hmm. I think that only comes from a place of, of profound fear. You, you have to feel so out of control yeah. that the only way you can feel control is to see it imposed on someone else by yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, um, that... <clears throat> I, I think that that's at the root of so much of it. And and <clears throat> that's, I think, what makes it so sad. Um, yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I feel like whether it's fear of other people's happiness or other people's autonomy, mm -hmm. you know, I, I look at, you know, this to me just insane. I, it's, it's insane to me that there's a debate in our country about about health care about Ugh, abortion mm -hmm. about you know about women's bodies this that there's this raging debate mm -hmm. and the debate is not possible without re without religion you know it's a it, the this idea of like what what fear animates that is it mm -hmm. is it fear of choice is it fear of freedom is it fear of women and i think the answer is yes yes yes, yes. it is yes, <laughs> yes, yes, it yes, is. yes. yes all of it. yeah the, this fear that men have of not being able to control mm -hmm. control women 
Um, and all that comes from a, a profound fear. I, I, I don't understand it. I, I, I think that some of the most faithful people, at least outwardly, mm -hmm. claim to not be afraid because they have this incredible well of faith, you know, mm -hmm. seem to have the most fear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you hear about the Supreme Court case uh, in Florida about the coach who wanted to pray on, on the football field after his games? Yeah. And I actually, there's a really great episode of um, what Roman Mars can learn about con law, which is literally just like, it, 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 it doesn't matter. It's about constitutional law. And they went over the week that week in the Supreme Court with the row, row thing and did such a great job of explaining like how they got to the conclusion they did because they kept saying like he was just trying to do a quiet prayer guys everyone should be able to do a quiet prayer yeah. and I think it was Sotomayor wrote the dissent and was like she added a picture into the dissent which has never happened she's like this is not that this is not what you are pretending yeah. it is he was drawing attention to, to himself this is not quiet sorry I didn't mean to start yet like, no, he no, and, no. <laughs> it just this willful naivete of the Supreme Court to like pretend they're calling in balls and strikes, but obviously are just doing whatever the fuck they want to do. Yeah, no, it's 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 shocking. It's, it uh, it would be shocking if it if you hadn't watched it happen in <laughs> right. painful slow motion over the last twenty years, but. Um, but yeah, it's and it, it it reminds me very much, you know, one of the scenes that that we had to fight for very hard on on Midnight Mass was the um uh was the school scene where everybody, all the adults sit in the classroom to talk about you had to fight for that? Yeah, it's it's like a seven minute scene. Oh, just in terms and, of yeah, gotcha. just just in terms of of the the degree to which sure. we were no longer talking about vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and and really getting into you know the vampires are a metaphor guys come yeah, on it's, it's, well we didn't really want the metaphor so much as the vampires we the vampire we made show along the way cool. <laughs> yeah it's um but that's something that that drives me crazy is are, are the 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 double triple and quintuple standards that come with that where you know i cannot imagine the same people who are trumpeting this case and saying, yes, of course, you know, this Christian prayer mm -hmm. needs to be publicly protected. Right. Um, if it had been any other religion, you know, all of that, uh, this uh, argument completely collapses. Absolutely. Yeah. Or when they were, uh, when Amy Coney Barrett was going through her hearings and everyone's like, um, everybody hates her because she's Catholic. And it's like, no. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Have you checked out the Supreme Court lately? Because I don't think that's what's going on. I think yeah, the fact that she's like 16 years old is troubling, but what do I know? Well, and that she's that she's radical, you know. That, so radical. That, because you know, it's like and a liar. <laughs> like a yeah. A it's complete like John liar. Kennedy was Catholic, you know, like that that wasn't the, the thing. You know, the Catholicism in and of itself isn't going to be the thing to protest. No. It's what it's what they do. It's what mm -hmm. they what they're actually about because mm -hmm. and the other thing that strikes me is how you know how so many of those actions have absolutely nothing to do with Christianity or Catholicism. Absolutely. Well, it's whatever they want is part of their faith. That's kind of what right. I have gotten together of like I want to do whatever I want to do. And you can't tell me what to do because I'm claiming it's my faith. So I don't want to mask and I don't want to like, you know, acknowledge that gay people exist. And um, I get to do all of those things because I'm Christian and you cannot criticize my religion. Otherwise right. you are a bad person. Right. And it's just and, like, and, and not just that, not just that I want to do this, but mm -hmm. this is also, I want to make sure that you live your life this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Regardless or, of whether you agree with me. Yeah. Yeah. It's that great. that's where it it because i i've had this you know i i have these pockets and i'm sure you go through similar waves of you know i i love the the name of your podcast because the friendly atheist you know this is an important word yeah and um so frequently atheists are kind of painted as you know arrogant or hot-headed or angry well i'm all of those things but also yes. <laughs> 
and it's like, but yes, and but we have these, we go through these, you know, these waves, mm. of reactions because there's this sense, and I, I find this with a lot of friends who are secular, who are atheist. There's this sense that there's an expectation in there that reasonable arguments will win, mm -hmm. um, that uh, evidence matters, mm -hmm. um, and time and again that isn't the case, and and. So yes, that makes people frustrated. Yeah, it's easy to get angry. It's easy to see too how far, you know, how far things are being pushed mm -hmm. in the other direction, and and start to realize that, you know, <laughs> a friendly academic curiosity mm -hmm. isn't going to stop. Right. This. That that you know you have to get angry sometimes. Yeah. Um, I think that is a actually I love that because we especially women are constantly told that like if you get angry you're in the wrong or you're a bad person or you're not being rational or whatever and like I can be rational and also angry I do it every day <laughs> like it's yeah. I'm not limited to one um one thing at a time Dottie please sorry my dog decided this is the moment she has to tear her bed up so <laughs> so this is cool for us um <laughs> but anyway I, I just, it's just very, very frustrating that people seem to understand what the freedom of religion means for themselves. Yeah. But do not know how to apply that to other people. Right. And and that that's something that, you know, the the fundamental misconceptions about that, you know, just just the the concept that it's this is a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. you know? No, Not, no, no, it isn't. Um, the founding fathers, you know, all wanted this. No, they did. Hella weren't. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's all provable. We have, that's the thing is, yeah. we have their writing. But you have yeah. people like, I don't know if you've heard of this man, uh, David Barton is his name. He yeah. is like basically an alternate historian. He is like, his books are about actually the founding fathers loved Jesus. Let me show you all of the examples I have. There are very few. Ex it's like, um, did you know that Alexander Hamilton went to church? So I think we know what he wants for AR-15s, right, guys? Like, right. Yeah. it is this wild, also the appeal to authority that they love to do because you can't, like the Founding Fathers can't answer for what they said. Right. And, and, but but then when you point out that they wrote, you know, that they wrote everything down very explicitly. And specifically wanted to have amendments. Yeah. <laughs> like, and it and and left room to say, we don't know how this is going to go, mm -hmm. and we need to understand that people are fallible, and we yeah. need to leave room for improvement well, as I, situations change. Yeah, it it's it's crazy. I think um, there's also like a recency bias that comes to play a lot. That for a long, like for example we were adding states left and right up until the 20th century. And now people are like statehood for Puerto Rico, statehood for Washington, DC. And everyone's like, we don't add states to this country. Like we absolutely historically do yeah. look at Alaska. We don't like, of course we just grab shit if we can find it. Like, of course. Yeah. We course. just haven't done it lately. Lately. And yeah. that doesn't, it doesn't go bad. You can still, <laughs> Like the constitution yeah, is rotting. <laughs> no, it's um it's it's I remember, you know, God, there was a documentary years ago <coughs> called uh, called Jesus Camp. Yes. Um, Holy shit. Terrifying, right? Terrifying. But, and I think that must have been what 15 years ago or something like that. And something like that. I remember watching it and them talking about the political mobilization, um, God's army. Mm-hmm we stole completely for midnight mass mm -hmm. um and i remember at the time feeling like the the ideas that they're talking about are way out there they're deep in the future there's a long way to go and there's a series of checks and balances between where we are mm -hmm. there and no it's you know now now we're there mm -hmm. and and then even down to row you know to how many friends when it was about I think back to the luxury of being able to argue about, you know, uh, Bernie and Hillary. Mm, um, and, those were the days. Yeah, right. You know, and, and like that was the problem. And but the 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 luxurious arguments that people would have, where it'd be like, well, what about you know the Supreme Court and what about Roe? And it's like, no, 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 no. That's never going to happen. There are supports and protections in place. And no, there aren't. It, I... it, it all, you know, it, 
it's amazing. Yeah. I had a blow up fight with a family member who will really remain nameless, who is one of the richest people I know and yelled, this is probably 2017, yelled at me about you're wasting your time worrying about Roe. They're not going to, it's settled law. You're making yourself crazy. Yeah. You can't do anything about it. You're being like hysterical about this. Calm yeah. down. And truly the day it it was overturned, I almost called her. I almost called her and be like, you could, you, fuck yeah. you. Genuinely, yeah. absolutely fuck you. I'm holding you personally responsible for this right now because I need to be mad at somebody and it's you congratulations <laughs> i yeah. it was hard to kind of see it coming but kind of what you said with the jesus camp thing i want to get back to that because that i think is why the left is going to be floundering for a long time because say what you will about the conservatives they are an organized machine organized. and patient and pa- yes oh what a yes yeah. patient <laughs> yes 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 because patience and faith are almost the same thing and um holy shit the the left you know and 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 this is true i think of, of a lot of secularists it's harder to be patient because faith isn't a luxury that we can lean on you mm-hmm. know it's, it's about immediacy and it's about it's about what's right in front of us right now and reacting to the facts on the ground. Mm-hmm. The The problem I think that's happening is that we've gotten into a society where facts don't matter anymore. And, and more than any other time, maybe since the dark ages, what matters is what we believe. Mm-hmm. And that we, th- these little tribes, these little bubbles on Facebook that pop up where sure like beliefs just come Mm -hmm. together and can look a fact in the face and say no Mm -mm. doesn't matter Mm -mm. um it doesn't feel right to me yeah it's about what i feel Mm -hmm. in my heart i know this Mm -hmm. i know vaccines are bad Mm -hmm. i know the earth is flat Mm -hmm. i know donald trump won the election Mm -hmm. you know all these things um and the facts no longer are relevant so we are in a struggle of conviction of belief Mm -hmm. and it's impossible for i think for atheists for secularists for people who are 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 relying on fact Mm -hmm. and reason we're not going to win a battle of belief we don't have the practice no we don't have the faith no well we don't have a single thing that we're fighting for right yeah and 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 the beauty of a catch-all that Mm -hmm you know, that a, that a religious faith can, can provide because you can change the goals mm. left and right within the mm-hmm. umbrella of the faith. And you can walk people further and further and further toward, you know, all sorts of different causes, um, which is something else that was really fun to play with in the show is, mm-hmm. you know, how, how you look at Jonestown, you look at, at belief systems that become toxic. Mm. I was actually watching, sorry to interrupt, I was watching a uh, documentary about um, the Heaven's Gate. Yeah, uh, I saw that. And, I, and yeah. I truly was like, ooh, this feels like Midnight Massey a little bit of like, you just keep getting like in tune and in tune and in tune, all of a sudden you're drinking arsenic in your church. Yeah, and it's it's incremental. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not that you start, people don't dive in face first mm-hmm. into Heaven's Gate or Jonestown in the 11th hour. Right. You know, they, they have to be led mm-hmm. to that point. And, and that's why I find documentaries like that fascinating, especially when they're interviewing survivors mm-hmm. who look back and are like, yeah, I can't explain to you how rational this felt. And, and, and again, you come back to what does it feel like? Mm-hmm. Right? You know, and, and the thing is the feelings can be completely kind of fabricated around people by the community oh you can artificially give somebody a feel like that's what mega churches are yeah is you're just all like whipping yourselves up into this like religious <laughs> fervor it's just everybody's being manipulated and you feel so good afterwards you're like cool yeah. god rules and and if you feel good then it must be good mm-hmm. 
right? So yeah, it, yeah it's it's it, it makes me very nervous for my kids because <laughs> it puts me in a place where I have to kind of admit to them that you know the data doesn't matter as mm-hmm. much as it, as it should. The facts don't matter because you're always going to be up against someone who or a system or even an individual who may have a much deeper well of belief mm-hmm. um, than you do mm-hmm. if your belief is hinged on observable fact. Um, the it's, fact it's, that, yeah. yeah, well, the fact that you and I presume we're willing to change our mind given the appropriate, yeah, yeah I'm absolutely willing to change my mind. And for me, that's a one of my favorite things about myself is I'm so, very good at admitting when I'm wrong and I'm wrong so much. Um, and the idea of never being able to admit, which is like a toxic masculinity thing as well, of just like, if I said it, I'm going to die on that hill. Like it does, I will not ever backtrack. I will not say I said something wrong. It, it's, I will either just deny it that it ever happened or I will die on that hill. Cause I guess that's my brand now. <laughs> yeah. Or you are now my enemy. Yes. Because you pointed out that I was wrong. Mm, we yeah. are now, we and are you're now the bad guy for doing yeah. that for me. Um, that it's, it, you're completely right. And, and it's, um, it's hard to imagine how it's hard to imagine what a successful political or social movement looks like mm-hmm. that can combat that and i think mm-hmm. that's that's what's so kind of frightening about yeah. today um, well i i think kind of the flip side when you talked about um how uh atheists are go oh shit i think i just had brain fog and completely lost what i was gonna say god damn it <laughs> covid it's one it's- of these days <laughs> I can just feel it leaving my brain and it's like, all right, whatever. I'll see you next time, I guess. Um, so, boop, boop, boop. what else? I'm just looking at my notes. No, sure. Um, boy, okay. I don't want to keep, did we have a hard out? I don't want to, uh, to keep got- you any longer than, <laughs> than needed. I have... I've got another couple of minutes, but I should get great. going pretty soon. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so you have something new coming out soon? I do. I have I have a show. You gonna do some <laughs> promo uh, stuff with me? Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, <why not? laughs> this is like the first promo stuff I've done for this show ever. Oh, okay. Let's let's get your like yeah. your spiel in order. My spiel. I yeah. know. So this is my rough, unpracticed okay. spiel. It's all right. Um, Only 12 people listen to this. Don't worry. <laughs> Hello, all of you. Yeah, um, we know them all by name. No, just <laughs> um, so I have a show called The Midnight Club. It comes out in October. Um, it's unrelated to Midnight Mass. It's uh, based on a book by Christopher Pike um, from the mid '90s, which were these little scholastic. You oh know, my book god! Put the paperbacks. Yeah. Um, and they all had like neon covers, and they were they were like. R.L. Stein, except a little older uh-huh. and more risque for for the teen audiences. But it's it's my first YA show. Um, oh, cool! Yeah, it's for the kids. I I just showed it to my eleven year old, uh, who it's the first thing of mine he's ever seen. Really? Well, I guess you I, don't have a ton that's family friendly. <laughs> it's really my kids cannot watch what I make uh, until no. they're until they're much older. But uh, but I let him watch this one, and he he. Uh, he really liked it, and I'm hoping that that means it'll be a hit with the with the teens. But I think for people coming off of Midnight Mass, mm-hmm. this is going to be like whiplash. A total <laughs> shift. <laughs> oh my god! It's, it's just popcorn and uh-huh. teenagers, and it's spooky. And I think the longest conversation uh, in the show is about a minute long. It's what? Uh, it's, no monologues. The- it's, no yeah. monologues. I know. How it's, am I going to know if it's a Mike Flanagan joint? <laughs> it's. I know. It's. Well, you'll. The only way you'll know it's it's a Mike Flanagan joint is you're going to recognize like half the cast. Your cast. <laughs> yeah, and you're gonna you're gonna be like, oh yeah, okay. There's yeah, all. Yeah. Of them. Oh yeah. Um, there's. There's the kid from ET again. Um, you'll be like, oh yeah. So this is all about teenagers. I don't know any of these people, but every grown up is from one of the other. <laughs> um. 
but uh yeah it's it's a fun little show and and it'll be netflix i think october 7th it's out so it's spooky but not terrifying it's not terrifying okay. yeah, it's, it's definitely for the younger viewers yeah um okay one this is like the biggest question before i let you go but it just i just thought of it because i'm going to see this this double feature this weekend can you talk a little bit about the Stephen King's hatred of the movie The Shining and how much he right. loves Dr. Sleep and how great that must feel for you. Oh, it's wild. To oh, this, this day, that's wild. Um, so yeah, you know, King, I mean, famously, famously hates The Shining. Hates it. Hates it. And I read the show, sorry, to immediately interrupt you. I finally read the book a couple of years ago. I'm like, oh, I get, this is not yeah. the same story. I not understand. Not the same his, at all. Yeah. yeah. Like Hunting um, of Hill House and the book, some of the names Unrelated. Were similar. Yes, yes. I was so confused when they said there were siblings. I was like, I don't think I read the right what? book before this. <laughs> oh yeah. No, we we I did a I did a rather terrible adaptation of the Hill House. <laughs> really, really terrible adaptation. It was a haunted um, house on a hill, so yeah, legally. It had some of the names. <laughs> it, it, um, but my my yeah, argument. Whose hand now, am I holding? Which is the best line of the book awesome awesome scene of the book it, mm -hmm. but i felt like the book had been done perfectly in 63 oh, in the robert wise movie so good and i was like i'm not going to improve on that mm -hmm. so and i can't make it 10 hours long <laughs> yeah that's so, not <laughs> yeah so we we just we broke it into pieces and tried to build them into something new mm -hmm. um which is something i love to do but it, it is you know it can upset fans of, mm -hmm. of material um and i i imagine <laughs> You know, it's funny because Stephen King speculated when he saw Hill House, he was like, I think Shirley Jackson would approve. Oh. But, you know, we'll never know. And it's, it's something... that haunting of people, not actual ghosts, that kind of thing. Right. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and that, you know, I can imagine how an author feels watching their creation broken apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how he felt with The Shining. I think he I see. felt it was like, it, it took the names and some of the situations and it jettisoned the whole point. Mm -hmm. um, and for him, you know, so he wrote that uh, <coughs> in the throes of, of his own alcoholism mm -hmm. with a young son and a marriage that was under incredible strain from, from his drinking and the anxiety he had about what he could do to his family if he didn't get it under control. Mm. You know? And so Jack Torrance in, in the novel, um, he saves his family because the alternative for Stephen King at the time, I imagine, was too horrifying to entertain. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the movie, you know, <clears throat> not at all. He goes crazy. Quite the opposite. Immediately. And then, yeah, and then freezes to death. Um, but in, in the book, he, he goes to the boiler and refuses to reset the boiler. He blows mm -hmm. up the hotel. He saves his family. Mm -hmm. um, and so when dr sleep came around you know i'm 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 this kind of child of of disparate parents because i'm a king fanatic mm. but i love the shining i love so, cooper's movie so good so great and and yes i i you know they're not the same thing and yes. they're not really related mm -hmm. but i love them both and so um when i read dr sleep the novel is just out the gate just flipping off kubrick it's just, oh my god yeah. it's so actively angry <laughs> yeah like page one is like all that shit in the movie didn't happen like, yeah um and everybody boo with me we yeah, all hate this on. movie right <laughs> and so i'm reading the book and i'm like <clears throat> i love the book but i'm like oof um the crazy thing is as a fan of the movie who grew up with the movie mm all the visuals that I had in my imagination reading the book were from the movie. Of course, yes. And so I had this like horribly schizophrenic experience where it was like, I'm reading this new story that's Stephen King, but everything I picture is Kubrick mm -hmm. and they're fighting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're, they don't work. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I got the job, <clears throat> my whole pitch was to do as faithful as possible an adaptation of Dr. Sleep but in the cinematic universe of Kubrick and specifically to take the ending and stage it in the hotel. Um, and I wouldn't do the movie unless King said yes. Oh. And um, <laughs> he said, no, <laughs> he, he said, I, I, I don't want to do the overlook. 
Did you yeah. have any kind of relationship with him at this point? I don't know exactly. Like, had you worked with him before? Yeah, I, I'd done Gerald's game already. Gerald's game. Okay, cool. Yep. So, so he, you know, he really liked. So that he act. knows who you are and like knows what your jam is. And he said yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, he was like, I, I don't want to do the overlook, and I was like, okay. But before before you say no, because if you say a firm no, I'm going to walk away from the movie and, and yeah. respect your wishes. Um, but before you say no, just imagine if the hotel was still standing and left abandoned for all these years. And Dan is eight years sober. And he comes walking through the gold room. And there's a, a glass of whiskey waiting for him. And there's the bartender in in, in the red velvet tux and the bartender's his dad and he kind of mulled it and then said okay do it um, and so we made the movie uh he he had loved the script so i already kind of felt like we were you know we, were, we had a leg up on it mm -hmm. but I, I went to maine with the movie and i sat with him in a theater and watched it with him mm -hmm. um sitting right next to him just staring at him i can't imagine it was bizarre and one of the coolest and weirdest days of my whole life um but i i don't remember the movie i i watched every micro reaction that he had uh-huh to it which i'm was sure like, was really chill for him oh, I'm <laughs> to have sure somebody staring I'm really, <laughs> um he, mr. King, uh, did you see that good part i did mr king <laughs> what do you think of that was that too much <laughs> Um, that's spooky <laughs> is that okay and, and the thing we had kind of done was we took the ending from the shining that he wanted that mm -hmm. Kubrick got rid of mm -hmm. and we gave it to Dan at the end of Dr. Sleep so he got he got his ending mm -hmm. and um at the end of the movie and I'm like if he hates this my career is over um and the end of the movie was 45 minutes in the overlook so it was like oh, shit and I killed the character that he let live and yeah like, you sure did movie. yeah and I was like yeah but did, we'll kill him uh so I, I was on pins and needles and at the end of the movie he he leaned over and he said I think you did a great job and I kind of shat myself and <laughs> and showed myself out of the theater uh -huh. and um oh boy and it was awesome and he over the years since then and I've seen other interviews where he's said this um, he my said husband that, just sent me an article that's like Stephen King's still really fucking into Doctor Sleep. <laughs> yeah, and he, but he he a few times has said that Doctor Sleep changed the way he felt about The Shining movie, and that it warmed it up for him a little. Um, and I don't think he'll ever like it, right? But a lot of the anger that I used to hear in the interviews mm. about The Shining is softened now i wonder and, if he can appreciate it as its own separate pe like can he separate himself from it like this i'm gonna watch this not thinking this is my book that is being adapted he he can do that in a lot of stories mm -hmm. um and he's very interesting when he talks about adaptations because he's had so many and they run the gamut you so know? oh my god um they, some of them are the worst movies ever made absolutely what's the <laughs> one with are... the trucks Oh, uh, Maximum Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive. He Holy directed cow. that movie. Yeah, on cocaine. He and yeah, cocaine directed uh, cocaine that movie. directed that movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very true. Uh, but he'll say that when it comes to adaptations, it took him a while to realize that he didn't need to really live and die by how they came out because he wins no matter what. Mm. He said if, if, if the movie sucks, people say, well, the book was better. And if the movie's great, they say, well, yeah, it's great. It's based on a great book, you know, that he always kind of wins. That's a good um, point. But there's something about The Shining where he did, he's never had that attitude. And you talked about other movies that he doesn't like, uh, adaptations of his stuff. And he's like, eh, it didn't work. But would, with The Shining, he's mad. And Would and, you argue that The Shining is like the most successful adaptation of his work and the one he hates the most? Well, when it so when it came out it bombed it it did it it was box office failure oh i didn't know that um it's because of that terrible poster with the yellow and the, the yellow weird... poster what yeah. is that <laughs> i have no it's idea the worst. um it and and it was funny when dr sleep bombed he called me um oh, the, i think i realized the, it bombed <laughs> oh it completely tanked completely tanked. i loved it well that's thank weird. you i look i 
people love the movie. Like the, it's one of the movies I think that the people who have seen it really like it. Mm, I loved it. I think that yeah. the addition of the, like, honestly, my favorite moment in the movie is your addition when, um, what's her face is dying and she says, kill yourself to the guy. And he, oh, him. Yeah. such a good addition and so powerful. I loved it. Anyway, continue whatever we were. were saying. Huh, look, I'm thrilled with that. I thought people were gonna be mad that we killed Billy, but, um, I but mean, yeah, it was rough stuff, but, uh, the, he, he called me after and, and I was very depressed mm. because our box office was so bad. Mm. And he said, well, here's the thing, you know, the shining bomb completely tanked critics mm -hmm. hated it nobody went to see it became a classic mm -hmm. uh it, he said i remember when the shawshank redemption came out mm -hmm. bombed, completely mm -hmm. tanked um, i forgot that was a stephen king adaptation oh yeah and and that of one course. i think is, to me that's season one. yeah like that mm -hmm. yeah um that one to me I, I think shawshank might be the best king adaptation but but yeah. it completely tanked and and so he said look you know the I'm sure, you know, we all feel a little bruised this morning, but people will find it and mm -hmm. and give it time because mm -hmm. no one remembers the box office performance in 20 years of a movie that people really like. So give it a minute. Yeah. Uh, and he was right when it when it hit streaming, mm -hmm. it started to do really well. And like it, now today, when I talk to people about it, they're like, Dr. Sleep. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. Like it, it found it finally found its its little audience, <laughs> mm. but um, but yeah. So he uh, that's a very long answer to your question. I'm sorry about that, but it's yeah, um, it was a <clears throat> it was very weird. I'll tell you the the coolest thing of the last yeah last little rambling anecdote about those two movies because it takes us all the way back to where we started our conversation. What a good um, story tell you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about it's all about story. The fly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, King wrote The Shining when he was in the grips of his alcoholism. He wrote Dr. Sleep when he'd been sober for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and when his son had now kind of grown up to be the age that King was when he was at his worst. Um, and I always thought the two stories were two sides of a coin, that one was addiction, one was recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, one was about rage and one was about forgiveness. and um, there's a sequence in Dr. Sleep in the book, and we did it in the movie too, um, that takes place at an AA meeting. Mm -hmm. And Dan Torrance in the book, you know, really finds a community at AA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, of course, comes from uh, from King's experience mm -hmm. in the program. Um, and we had this moment for, it was uh, Dan's uh, eighth birthday where he gets his, he gets his chip mm -hmm. and comes up and, and testifies mm -hmm. um and <laughs> we were able to just shoot it as one long push into close-up yeah. ewan and um ewan mcgregor as he stands there and delivers that was eight years sober um whoa really yep uh he was exactly where dan torrance the character was holy and, cow um, Rebecca Ferguson, who plays Rose the Hat, mm -hmm. uh, I think was four years sober while we filmed. Um, several cast members had been sober for years, AA and NA. Wow. And, uh, we're going to meetings in Atlanta where we were filming mm -hmm. um, and taking each other to meetings. And um, wow. so the, the coolest conversations I had about sobriety and about the program and everything else were with Ewan McGregor and Rebecca Ferguson and Stephen King. Um, and making Dr. Sleep was when I decided to get sober. Um, and while I didn't connect <laughs> as much with AA as Dan Torrance, you know, or as some of my cast and, and Stephen King as well, um, there was something to the community of it and to the supportive spirit of it mm -hmm. that I thought was pretty beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I'll always think that. Yeah. Uh, and I got to write to Steve about a year after the movie came out um, <laughs> when I was celebrating my, my first year sober, uh, my first birthday. And I sent King an email and, and said, I didn't tell you this at the time, 
but you know today is today is my my one year sober anniversary and and I don't think I would have done it and I don't think I'd be able to do it if it weren't for the experience I had making doctor sleep mm. um, so thank you for that and he wrote back and said congrats and he said and what a coincidence um today is my 30th anniversary we have the same sober day whoa uh, sorry I, I yelled so loud I know isn't that crazy and I did not know that um and he was off to a meeting and um that's yeah. wild and so we have by by honest coincidence we have the same the same sober uh, birthday um that would have been so a wild thing for you to stage <laughs> yes. yes um but uh but yeah and and he was off you know three decades later off to off to a meeting where he was going to sit and look at the 12 steps and mm. i'm sure share you know share a little a little <laughs> a moment uh, along his way so um so yeah, my my feelings about AA and my fascination with AA uh, are complicated mm -hmm. because I I've seen firsthand a lot of the beauty that's come out of it, mm -hmm. um, regardless of my inability to access it mm -hmm. um, because of the the kind of faith based core of it. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's still something I find beautiful and fascinating and. I have seen it improve a lot of people's lives. Mm. Um, and I guess that's the thing with religion, right? Is that to the degree that people can improve themselves, it can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that people can cause misery for others mm -hmm. can be monstrous. And it really kind of, the only thing that matters is what, what they do, right? Yeah. And, it's yeah. almost like we need different names for like your religious faith versus like your shoving of your faith yeah. of your like externalizing of your faith feels different than I rely on my relationship with God to keep me going, which I tons of people talk about and I feel fine with and, you know, no problem there. It's the second it is externalized and, and pushed out even like God, they're evangelists. Like that's their whole jam is share, you know, spread the gospel. And boy, that's obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, when it's you're, I think you're totally right. When it's inward, mm. it, it's a it's an incredible thing. And the minute it becomes outward, mm. it's 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 destructive. Mm -hmm. And and that's just such a such a sad sad thing about it. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. It it. it you know, religion is neither good nor bad. It is what people do with it. It's all, it, and it's hard when people know I'm an atheist, and I don't know if you have the same thing that people think it means you dislike. It means you think Christians are stupid yeah. or or whatever. And that's what went on Midnight Mass. Um, Aaron's character is devoutly Catholic. Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron. Okay. Aaron's the yes. Kate is the actress. Aaron's the person. Okay. Um. And that was something I clocked immediately. Like, I don't think I knew much about like your background, but like, okay, so this guy's an atheist, but she's Catholic and she's not, she's being treated with respect and dignity and, and valued and not like dismissed by our atheist character. Like, I don't know. I just kind of got myself onto a little rant. Oh, no, no, it's, it, it is. No, I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's, there is that feeling that like, if you're an atheist, you must have hostility ingrained mm -hmm. all religious people, mm -hmm. which I think is not the case at all. And, and the atheists I know are the, like some of the sweetest humans in the world. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think it it's, it's directly kind of proportional to the degree of control and hostility a person would project on someone else. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I respect I've, I've, you know, family members and friends who are deeply religious, who I think are wonderful people. Mm -hmm. And I, I, them, I will respect their, their faith and what it does for them. Mm -hmm. If they were to weaponize that against someone else, my degree of respect for them would decline okay. proportionally, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or vanish entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, I think I, as I get older, I'm very much I, I plant my flag much more in humanism where it's like, yeah, the degree of respect to which I give an organization or a belief system mm -hmm. or a person 
depends entirely on how it treats others. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Excellent. Uh, any quick thoughts on two storms you want to share? My favorite episode of show of all time. <laughs> oh, holy crap. That thing. Um, <laughs> it seems like a bear. I said in my initial email, I, I said to Mike, I was like, I want to watch a feature length documentary about the making of that. What One of my uh, best friend's husband is a camera operator out of uh, uh, Louisville. If you ever need somebody? Um, <laughs> he's incredibly uh, talented. And we were talking about, we, were, we all love the show. And I was like, Jeff, you need to like, can we watch it together? And you can like walk me through how they would have done it. And he's like, Jess, I don't know. I don't just know because I'm a camera operator. <laughs> I wasn't there. Um, but I know there's like a little featurette, but so this, the episode is at a funeral and it's all one shot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually five shots made to look like one shot. <gasps> When did the uh, lights stop, Mike? I know it's well, oh. we couldn't yeah, we couldn't do the whole thing. <laughs> um but we had to like we built uh our two sets, the funeral set and the hill house set, um, on adjacent stages with a hallway that connected them because we knew we had to walk mm -hmm. from one to oh, the other. It was so episode. fucking cool the first it's time so you cool. watched them walk through it. It's um we built the whole season around that episode mm -hmm. and uh we rehearsed it for I mean, I have footage of us walking the build, like we had, the whole design of Hill House had to have access points for cast and crew for that episode. Mm -hmm. And so it, it drove everything. And we rehearsed for months and months and months and months. Uh, we shut down production to continue rehearsing. At one point, our studio didn't want us to do it anymore because it was expensive and difficult. And uh -huh. they were like, well, you just shoot it like a normal episode. And we said, no, yeah, we have to do it um we rehearsed it with uh, there's you know on set uh there's a group of people called second team who are the stand-ins for mm. for the actors they usually they stand on their marks they're there while we're lighting mm -hmm. so the actors aren't standing there for an hour waiting to be lit mm -hmm. um and a lot of second teamers a lot of stand-ins are actors you know that, that's one of the ways to kind of stay on set and and network and mm -hmm. keep keep working while they work their way up um, and for us, that whole episode was performed from top to tail by our second team, mm. acted out the whole episode like a play. And we practiced with them to teach the camera operators all the moves and the lighting operators, because there's hundreds of lighting cues. Uh -huh. um, so for months, it was just us and the, the actors were nowhere near. And you know, we had their stand-ins mm -hmm. who were performing it as though they were playing the parts and probably ran it a thousand times easily. <sighs> um, and I have it all filmed because we were rolling on it toward the end when we were really close to having it done. We filmed the whole episode with this other cast. Um, cool. And then when the principal cast came in, um, they'd been on hiatus for the holidays while we were working on the app and they, they all came back and I sat the cast in a room and I played the episode for them and said, you guys have to do that. <laughs> and we've all learned it. The camera department's learned it. You know, the choreography of it, we had to run in and pull chairs out from behind everybody so that the camera didn't hit them and then put them right mm -hmm. back. So they turned around and fly out equipment and move walls and like do all this crazy stuff. Um, well, can I just add in, if anybody hasn't seen this, in addition to the fact that this is like one shot that's going, also there's statues that get turned like there's just like little pieces that get moved that's not just you're following somebody around a house it is like obviously shit is like the I think the best moment in it is when it's all the kids and then they do another sweep and it's them as children yeah. I just oh it's so good you guys if you haven't watched it what are we doing anyway continue uh continue please well it was it was uh <laughs> it remains the hardest thing I've ever had to do would you uh, do it again no would you, do you regret having done it no i love it yeah I'm, I'm i'm so proud of it um we almost didn't do it it mm -hmm. it we so many times we were that close to completely failing mm -hmm. on it um and even at the end we only barely survived it like by the skin of our teeth uh -huh. um <laughs> i look at it now and uh we relied on 
I mean, it, it, we asked more of our dolly grip on that episode than I think anyone will ever ask of him in his career ever again. Um, every crew member had to, you know, do a thousand percent yeah. of what they typically did. And I look at it now and all the things that could go wrong. And I don't know that I have the hunger or the determination that I had then mm. to go through with it. I think now I, I would have hit a point and been like, no. Nope. Did uh, you feel like you were proving something or just you wanted to manifest this thing in your head? <laughs> I, it was my first TV show. I wanted mm. a career in TV. Mm. It was mm. an awful shoot. It was a shooting that show was no fun. And we were on the brink of extinction kind of all the time. Wow. And I, I felt by the time we got to that episode, which we did toward the end, um, that there was a good chance that my career in television was over um, and that this show was going to be the only thing I did. And so hmm. I wanted to leave everything on the field. It was it was like, all right, if we're if we're going down, we're going down swinging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Jimmy had, World quote. <laughs> yeah, and, and it really was like. In the pitch, when I pitched the show, I had pitched this episode without knowing how to do it. And um, and I didn't want to retreat and kind of be like, well, we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so it turned into this, this Mount Everest challenge mm -hmm. for the cast and crew. Um, and we put everything we had on it. And uh, if the show hadn't been a hit, my thing was I'll always have that episode yeah, we will have always done that. Mm -hmm. um, and for the longest time, I thought the show wasn't going to be a hit. It, it uh, when it when it came out, everyone had kind of walked away from it, and the enthusiasm at Netflix and mm -hmm. Paramount and Amblin wasn't high, and Steven Spielberg had taken his name off the show, and and it was his name was on the show. It wasn't. He took it off. Wait, it was supposed to be though. Yeah, so it was, it was an Amblin Partners show. Oh, and, and he um, he decides kind of along the way if he wants to put Steven Spielberg presents, you know, on the show. Whoa. And and along the way, you know, the decision came down that he was like, nah, but, Good. you know, happy, happy for you guys. He was, not that he wasn't supportive, but he was just kind of it was everything was lukewarm. And, and there was this sense that, you know, the show could come out and just evaporate mm. uh, mm -hmm. like so many shows do. Mm hmm. And I'd already moved on. I'd, I'd gone on to Doctor Sleep, mm -hmm. um, and I was like, "Get me back in the in the theaters and away from TV." TV almost killed me. I lost forty five pounds making that show. Um, Whoa! Yeah, I I I I came out of it looking like like I was about to die, <laughs> and um, and it it you know it brutalized personal relationships uh, within the cast and crew and it, it just put an enormous amount of strain on everybody so we, we finished the show and was kind of like no more tv um and then it you know the show hit and it it did really well and people really loved it and all of a sudden all of that you know strife was kind mm -hmm. of forgotten and all of a sudden i had a career in tv and i've been riding that wave ever since but um but yeah i i I don't have the the fortitude today that I had mm. and in the sense of just everything being on the line. Sure. I'm comfortable now to do that. I'm but. really uh, surprised to hear that it was an unfun shoot because in my head, if a director is, a writer director is constantly reusing the same cast members, it's like, we had such a great time in the last <laughs> one. Let's do another one. Oh but yeah. This and, sounds and like, it's like, hey guys, remember that miserable project we all did? Who wants to do another one? <laughs> Oh well, yeah, and and there is there is a sense of you know there's this there people make the childbirth analogy sometimes where it's, <laughs> you know there there's a there's a sense that you you forget the labor pains afterward. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, a, a lot of the 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 cast who come back on my stuff, you know, we we it's because we're we're we've been in the trenches together, and, mm -hmm. and you know even if it's hard, we we believe in each other. Um, you know, not everybody comes back too. You know, mm -hmm. some people didn't come mm -hmm. out of Hill House and be like, no, I'm good. That was, <laughs> Did what I had to that do. was enough, you know, um, and didn't come back for the next one, you know, so, or decide to take a break. Mm -hmm. We'll come back and be like, I'm going to take the next one off, but then catch me later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a, 
it was a very hard shoot that one and um it's funny for the longest time i would point at that and kind of be like it's the most successful and life-changing project i did mm -hmm. and i hated it while we were doing it i i every day was like i had to force myself through the process it was such a such a crushing experience to do it um <laughs> on a show I, I loved and characters I loved and with actors I loved and crew I loved it was just um that that one for whatever reason was tortuous and I used to tell people that it was like yeah that was the worst production experience I ever had oh um, and then Midnight Mass was the best production experience I ever had and like a fraction of the people who saw Hill House watched Midnight Mass oh, so God, there, there's always this kind of thing of like you know, the ones that hurt the most tend to do really great. Uh -huh. The ones that felt great while you did them, like, yeah, don't don't hit as hard. Yeah. Did you have a special, uh, like when I used to wait tables, I always had a stall where I would go when I cried. Did you have a special <laughs> corner that you that you hid to scream or cry? Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I used to be I, I never uh, made it to to waiting tables. I was a bus boy. Oh, and so I, I, I had a spot. Uh, I was busting at Outback Steakhouse and I had a spot where I would steal a loaf of bread and hide in the corner and eat this loaf of bread and be sad. Um, <laughs> and uh, I still have that feeling uh, whenever whenever a show comes out, I'm always just like, I'm, I duck and cover every time one of these things is released. And there's kind of no way, I'm never going to feel good about it until the show's a year old. Uh-huh and it doesn't matter anymore and then i'll be like oh yeah that was i'm really happy with that but, you should start <laughs> buying those loaves and just keeping them in your house when you're when you're stressed and just start mawing just, on them <laughs> yeah stress stress eating the outback steakhouse bread do you uh, read you, you said you read reviews you read reviews of your work do, do you take it personally absolutely uh -huh, me too. It's, it's one of the worst habits I have. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Literally I on this show, at the end of every episode, I generally read a mean review <laughs> out loud because I'm like, look at this shit. People, because people don't like me personally a lot. Um, and anyway, it, isn't that it, it? It drives me crazy that like the internet has become this place where people can just stab strangers. Mm -hmm. It's um, really, you know, what happened actually. Somebody wrote a really shitty review, like about me personally, like my voice and my laugh or whatever. I read it on the air, and and at this point, I'm like, listen to what these people are saying about me. It's fine. I am who you like. I'm in my mid thirties now. I'm a little more established about like who I am, and don't. I'm not as worried about strangers. Um, but I read this one. It was just like, Jessica's an idiot. She doesn't have anything important to say, blah, blah, blah. And I read it. And then she emailed us and was like, hearing my words on your show broke me. Like, I felt terrible and went back and updated it. And yeah. I don't know what to take away from that story, but it's really interesting to me. It's, it is. It's, um, I had a, a similar experience when Dr. Sleep came out and someone had, I'd put up a thing on Twitter and someone had put just a really kind of shitty comment about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually responded to the comment, which I is, I have a rule to never. <laughs> That's your first problem. <laughs> never do it. You know? But for whatever reason, in this moment, I was like, it's important for me that they know that I saw it and that I'm upset. <laughs> Like that's gonna, like that's gonna. You're do making things. really good decisions at the time. Uh, terrible decisions. <laughs> it was a really. This one worked out. Then the guy. It was. It was fascinating because he DM'd me after the fact, and was like, "Look, I don't have anything personal against you. I'm going through a really hard time, and I didn't mm -hmm. think you'd be, you know." Um, and then I wrote him back and was like, "I'm sorry to hear about the hard time," and we actually are still in touch like oh, years uh, later yeah and and like it it turned out to be it turned out to be a really healthy interaction and we both were like i'm sorry that i just kind of came at yeah you because i don't know anything about you and <sighs> and um and i was just as as <laughs> out of line in my response to him. Right. And so we we both kind of put down the knives and then like he's a good dude and we've been we've been pretty good friends ever since. But like it's um <laughs> it's the strangest thing I think to your experience that I don't I don't think people really understand 
what they're putting out mm -hmm. and and that's a fascinating thing that if if it's put held up in front of them again mm -hmm. that it's like oh oh shit was but that me like, yeah, yeah that we have we have these lives that are so full of kind of unknowable triggers and stressors and, mm -hmm. and anxieties and if you can scream it into a void mm -hmm. um, and just lash out at something it can it can feel better and and i think the internet has done an incredible job of holding each other up as targets for that mm -hmm. and i think most people i like to think most people if they really were to look at it would be like i wouldn't say that right to another person this isn't how i really feel it's it's just a it's a strange thing we do i've had interactions with that like that on facebook that it's like somebody said something whatever and i responded and they're like this isn't real life. It's Facebook. And it's like, well, I'm a human being and I read your mean words about me. So it is a it little is bit my life. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's so real. And, and it's, and it's one of the reasons why at like my wife, my producer, they're all like, stop reading the stuff about the shows. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we, how interesting is it too, that we can shove aside positive things? Oh boy. Am I good at that? Yeah. Whew. You just, that it's like, doesn't even register well that guy's an idiot if he thinks yeah. i'm good so yeah. <laughs> like, well, that's not even worth yeah. the attention but somebody says something negative and we grab it and then like it echoes and like i'll sit up at two in the morning and be like oh yeah and like be like <laughs> like like determined oh. at 2 a.m to like have a rebuttal and mm -hmm. it's like there's no rebuttal like this person doesn't like me or... i do that in the shower i imagine arguments that i win <laughs> Yeah, of like, it, oh, like, this person thinks I'm this. Well, I'll show them. <laughs> you got this perfect like fantasy response that just dunks on them, and then they just go, "I'm sorry," yeah. and fade oh away. God. Oh my god, yeah. you're right. I never thought of it that way. I yeah. just needed you <laughs> to say that to me just now. You did it. Congratulations. You, you changed my me. mind. <laughs> yeah, I, my mind changed. Yeah, Oof. I've I've come around, and it's of course it isn't that way, and it's it's the. It's the strangest thing. I'm sorry you have to to deal with that. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's just yeah. part of being, I don't know, what do you think? It's part of, not that I'm like famous in any way, but we've got like 20,000 downloads. So like it, there's a little bit of a presence. <laughs> do you feel like personally when people attack you? Like, is it, I'm a bad person because I made this movie? Because <laughs> sometimes that's how I feel. I'm like, oh, I guess yeah. I'm just a bad person. <laughs> No, I mean, it, I yeah. Sometimes it really gets in. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can really, it can really get in there. And and there are times I've had to put away the internet. Mm. And be like, I need to step away from it for a month for, mm -hmm. for self care. And it's interesting because when you got in touch, you know, I get a lot of, um, I get a lot of kind of cold requests mm -hmm. on podcasts in particular. I don't tend to do them. Um, and and your show interested me. You know, I, I very much like what you are talking about and what you have to say. And and so I get a lot of these of, of these requests. And I got to the point at one point where I got paranoid that they were traps. That oh, it no. was Yeah. I, I got into this bizarre place where it was just like, you know, how do I know that like if I go out there and I talk about something personal, mm. you know. Um, and this one I knew kind of going in, it's like, we're talking about atheism. We're talking about alcoholism. Right. This is personal. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you get, you do it every time you you record a show, you're putting mm -hmm. yourself on a personal level out there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like this sense of like people waiting in the wings with the knives. Mm -hmm. that, you know, um, and the older I get, the more flinchy I've gotten and the more withdrawn I've gotten and the less eager I am to, to talk mm -hmm. in public um because i do take it personally and i and i and i have this like growing sense of discomfort with my life being visible mm -hmm. because it just you know you don't remember the positive impact it has and you take <laughs> you take that negative weight with you it mm -hmm. gets heavier mm -hmm. um but yeah I, i'm sorry you have to deal with it because you know you you started the show to talk about something very important to mm -hmm. you um, and to share that in the hopes that it could, uh, that it could galvanize other people mm -hmm. uh, and inspire conversation. And yeah. that's a vulnerable place to be uh, on a worldwide web. Well, yeah. 
and I, and this is uh, my co-host, his name's Hemant. Um, we are very different in that he doesn't talk about his family. He like, and I am like an open book. Mm-hmm. I talked about my miscarriage. I've talked about like sexual assaults that I've experienced. I'm very much an open book because I have the fortitude to be able to tell my story. Um, and I know that helps people because anytime I have those conversations, I get however many emails saying like, thank you for talking about, like everybody's ashamed to talk about miscarriages. That's this it's yeah. horrible thing. And for me, and it, I can be that person for them if, if they need it. But that also means that people know a lot about my life and I have to be aware of that and be careful with that. And I don't know, I've gotten recognized in public a couple of times, which is very strange for a podcaster, but I have a very distinctive looking dog and she draws a lot of attention. Um, but it is, I don't know, it's, it, sometimes it does feel like people are waiting to catch you. Yeah. That is what I feel off more than anything else. That's how I feel is that people who write in with things like that, they're not doing it. There are people who say, hey, you got this thing wrong. You misunderstood this thing. Let me help you understand it. And I am more than happy to take that. Right. Yeah. But <laughs> when it feels like a gotcha thing, it's like, to what end? To what end? What are we doing here? Like, do you feel better? Do you disagree with what I said? No, you just didn't like the word I used. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Thank you. <laughs> now, I, now I know that Brad doesn't like when I call something this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what, what, what does Brad feel when he turns off the computer? I guess is my question into your, yeah, like, what do you get out of it? What, it, what I think yeah. sometimes it's just, I think often it's just attention. I yeah. think that criticizing something is a quick way to get somebody's attention and they feel good about that. It feels good grabbing somebody's attention who you listen to or, admire or whatever it's it's cool it's cool for me to talk to you I like your art this is neat like I get it um but I don't know what Brad feels after that I think Brad feels like he's helping I truly think that he thinks that I'm like this dumb lady who doesn't get x and he really needs to help me with that but I mean, it is a lot of condescension and it's also just people just dis- not that this is now all about me. It's people just disliking me personally. Like uh, if they, somebody dislikes your show, you can take that personally. But if yeah. somebody dislikes my show, it's like, oh, just particularly, <laughs> we do not care for your bullshit. And that took a lot longer to get over of not just like people don't like this or that, or they think I'm too loud or I laugh too loud, which is true. Um, It took a long time for people, for me to be like, oh, this person just genuinely thinks I'm a capital B bad person. And I just have to move on with my life. I I don't know what else to say. Yeah. You're not going to win them over. Right. And Um, I don't care to anymore. No. And you're right. You know, I, I, I get, I get away with, being behind the camera a lot of mm-hmm. people you know I, I can put out a piece of my work and no one will have any idea mm-hmm. uh, that I'm there but I look at you know what you do I look at, at what Kate does you know and it's like when you're out there in yourself yep your voice your face mm-hmm. you know it's a whole different level of you know not I think fortitude for one mm-hmm. um, but a whole different level of of vulnerability on the web and, yeah. and it, it it just makes me sad that it's like um, one of the things I learned was the fastest way I could become enraged was to say on Twitter that I liked something. That why just, can't I yeah. just like things? Yeah. Why do people have say, to explain to me why something is actually bad? Yeah. Or or why I should like something else more, or just to say I liked this movie that I just saw, and it's like wrong dozens yeah wrong yeah and it's like no i did i promise i was there I yeah liked it. i enjoyed it yeah. and it doesn't How matter is this controversial yeah like you didn't cool like cool. watch yeah. literally anything else it's we're in the age of streaming <laughs> like find yeah. what you actually like but that that feeling of of um of of a kind of cultural desire to just smack mm. down 
someone's enjoyment, their opinions, just, just to smack. It's like the internet is just this thing where people get to smack around them mm -hmm. and somehow feel uplifted or fulfilled by it. But I, I suspect not. I suspect mostly just feel angrier. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's rough. But, yeah. And it's yeah. kind of addictive. <laughs> yeah. Really I mean, is. yeah, I'm still there every day. Uh -huh. I, show up, I show up every day. And, I, had, and... I had to actually unfollow every like Facebook news feed that I followed because I could not stop waiting in. Every time I saw like in peak COVID, I would see like 14 year old kid dies and it's laugh reactions and it's, well, that kid was chubby anyway, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I gotta get in there and then I do and I feel shitty for the next yeah. two hours and so I was just like I can't even see it because I don't have the self-control to not say something yeah <sighs> which is so just the pits just absolutely does um does Kate ever deal with um people mixing her up with her characters that's what I always think oh yeah um no very much and and she's, she's funny because she can kind of spot it where she'll be like oh no this person you know, this person's just talking to Theo Crane, uh -huh. or, you know, uh -huh. or this person was expecting Theo Crane and yeah. I walked in as me and it upset them. Um, or She's not uh, even wearing gloves. <laughs> I know. And she gets, she gets spotted all the time. So, you know, it's something that happens very frequently when, when we're out in public now, um, which makes us go out less. Yeah. Uh, and it, it started out as being so exciting mm -hmm. and, and flattering. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people who have this image of her in their head um, and get weirdly personal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but she still, you know, she loves interacting with her fans mm -hmm. and, you know, she goes and does the convention circuit here and there and really gets to interact with them. And, and some mm. of the people who she comes across kind of for every bumpy experience, there's like five ones that are really positive and, and people who really, you know, uh, who she really made a difference for mm -hmm. somewhere there. and then she can immediately forget those and just focus on the ones that are weirdos it, it's, it's just about <laughs> the bad one. yeah um but she she handles it better than i do to mm -hmm. be honest uh she's better at it and she um she's always a good kind of sounding board for me when i start to go a little a little crazy <laughs> reading the comments yeah. um you know she's quick to kind of remind me of the really important aspects of our lives and mm -hmm and that I'm always grateful for. We're doing our first convention together in October. No, Fun. September, September. Um, Where? In Connecticut. Connecticut. Uh, yeah, it's a Connecticut horror con. Um, it's something she was doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> I uh, Henry Thomas is doing it and Annabeth the Gish is doing it. And mm -hmm. I've never been available when they've done these before. And Kate was like, you should come. And I was like, nah, Are okay, fine. Are you excited or nervous? I'm nervous. Yeah. I, it's, it's outside of my comfort zone, but she and Henry both were like, no, there's a lot of people that you meet here who have a personal uh, story to tell about something in Hill House or Midnight Mass mm -hmm. that meant something to them personally. And and you should hear some of these stories. Yeah. That, that mean a lot. And and so I'm I'm taking their advice on this one, but I'm, I'm a little like, ah. Uh, is it like, do you have to like sit at a table and wait for them to come up and like make yeah. the small talk? Are you really good at small talk? <laughs> Awful at small talk. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just terrible at it. And, and like, there's this sense that I'm like, everybody here has like paid money to be here. Mm. I'm going to fuck this up for them. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to like ruin their experience. Cause I'm going to be boring. Um, Are you and... doing a panel or anything? Uh, I am. I'm doing a panel. I'm doing. I tried to. I tried to make it so that if people were, if anyone was there, excited to kind of to see me or Kate or haunting people, that like they'd get something out of it mm -hmm. um, that they can't get on, out of Google. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I tried to maximize it because I just have this like feeling of like I'm sorry that that you know this is all you get. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is who I am. Yeah, I'm disappointed by it too. But we're all gonna move on together. Yeah, we're all gonna make it through this. And, <laughs> and like, I just want to get back to the hotel room to like eat pizza and bed and watch TV. Like, 
you know, but we're all going to make it through. And <sighs> if, if the shows or the movies have, have meant something to them, mm -hmm. you know, that's, and they want to express that, then it's like, I, I want to, I want to be there for that. And mm -hmm. I want to thank them for that because yeah. they're the reason I have a career. If, if, you know, if people hadn't watched Hill House over and over again, um, which most people did. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, Gotta I find those ghosts. Gotta find those Gotta ghosts. Find the ghosts. Um, <laughs> then I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a career. So it's yeah. in a lot of ways, I'm there to kind of, to say thank you. Mm. Um, and to just kind of be there for for anyone who wants to say something because you know i've i've met people i've been fortunate that i've met people whose work has made a difference in my life in a big way mm -hmm. i've gotten it's like with with stephen king who mm -hmm. when for most of my life if you told me i could have reached out and said thank you to stephen king yeah i, I would have been like that sounds insane insanity um, but I was in a position where I could, and, and it was really meaningful for me to reach out to him and say, thank you for helping me get sober, even though you had no idea you were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure for him, it was just, you know, uh, okay, mm -hmm. but it, it meant a lot to me. So it's, 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 um, I'm hoping that it's that kind of experience. And I mean, you know. I think think it will be because I've been again on both sides of that coin and had somebody come up like literally I, I did a meetup in LA and this dude literally came in for I think five minutes between shifts came in and was like hi I can't stay I'm so sorry I just wanted to say you know this monologue to you thank you I have to go by like and it feels so good to thank the person for yeah bringing you comfort or joy or you know I talk to a lot of people who are like in the bible belt and so they can't talk about things like this in public and the our podcast of us like bullshitting and talking about the news and everything is their only outlet of like-minded people yeah discussing things that they care about and you know that's that's important and but but yeah do we have any more haunting series coming out? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I, mm. at, at the moment, anyway, no. Um, you know, the haunting shows are tough. They're they're tough to do, and all those ghosts, all those ghosts, <laughs> all those hidden ghosts. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, was that something you regretted immediately? <laughs> oh, that that I always loved, and yeah. and it was a last minute thing. It was really? it was like it was part of the pitch where I was like, we can hide ghosts the way they do in pictures, uh, and then everybody kind of forgotten about it while we were in prep and I went to local casting and I was like just get me give me two or three people every day who are in full ghost makeup and just have them standing by I don't know when I'm going to put them in but if you just every day if you have them there I will find a way to make it work and it was like I'd come to work and you're dealing with all these problems and all this stuff and I'd look over and at the craft service table you'd have like these three ghosts eating candy <laughs> And it was so fun. And and like I'd be like, all right, come here. Like we're gonna have to go to the piano. Or come here, you get behind <laughs> behind the curtain. And it became this fun joke of like I'd try to hide them in a way where the cast didn't know they were there. Oh. Um, and that was the fun of it. Funny. Was like yeah. And 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 it was it was a fun little way to keep things light. Mm -hmm. Um, and I knew it would be fun for the audience eventually, but we were we felt that felt like 10 years away. Yeah, yeah. It was really cool to have Carla come in and do a scene and then to kind of be like, Hey, Carla, look, uh, <laughs> and she'd turn and there's someone right here. And she's like, God damn it. You know? Um, and so funny. So, like that stuff was really just fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, <laughs> I don't, I don't think there's another haunting in the future. I, I always kind of said if the right idea mm. pops up, but I didn't want to force it. And I didn't want to just crank out shows with, the haunting, the haunting of, of yeah yeah um and just regurgitating what we did mm -hmm. i always wanted it to be different um, yeah and i just i don't have an idea for one so I, i'm just kind of like ah, I don't know. yeah i'm trying to think of other horror novels from that era that haven't been adapted and they're all they've all been done well, we, <laughs> it we seems like a list. we have we have a, a list of like all the classic horror literature uh-huh and i have a, a bunch of like half finished ideas that would run out of gas uh -huh. um but the thing that always kind of 
every time it was like, well, do I do haunting three or I want to do midnight mass? I really, mm. Or it was like, well, you know, we could go back and talk about the haunting, but you know, we've got these Christopher Pike books ready to go. And like, it's really important to try to make something my kids can watch. Mm -hmm. uh, and then <laughs> follow the house of Usher for a hot second. It was like, maybe that could be the haunting, the haunting house. of the house of Usher. <laughs> But it wasn't a ghost story. No. And yeah. and so it was like the Poe stuff isn't really ghost stories. And, you know, it's not really a haunting. Yeah. So, it would be forcing it too. Yeah, it, it, was, it was really forcing it. And it was like, so no, we're just doing, we're doing this cool Poe show, but uh -huh. it's not a haunting. Um, and so I've gotten to the point now where I'm just kind of like, I, I don't want to force it. Mm. If something comes along, great. But, you know, I always thought of that as a one-off. I didn't think it was like a, an anthology series. Bly Manor just felt like it felt like it would work. Yeah. In the framework. Yeah. And even then, you know, we, the criticism came in that it was different than Hill House. And it's yep. like, well, yep. but yeah, it's, a, it's a gothic romance. Yeah. Congratulations on watching two different shows. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was like, yeah, you know, we, why would we just do Hill House again? Yeah. We just did it. Yeah, um, I love wanted it to be different. So yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I think uh, the haunting might be behind me, but mm. um, we'll see. If 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 an awesome story shows up, we'll see. Do you prefer adaptations over original <laughs> ideas? Um, because I'm I, thinking I like it, you're like half and half, kind of, right? Yeah, I I don't really have a preference. Um, sometimes there's a piece of material I I'm madly in love with, and I can't wait to kind of riff on it. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes an original thing just roars out. And, and um, I don't have a one, each, each are challenging and there are different ways. And I love the comfort of having at least a roadmap that comes with adaptation as opposed to sure. blank page. You have to make it up. <laughs> yeah, it, like that can be really tough, but I also love the freedom of the blank page mm -hmm. and, and not worrying about, oh, am I going to piss off the author or the fans? Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, so yeah, I, I love them both. And I think I TV, for whatever reason, started with adaptation. So that seems to be kind of the mm -hmm. touchstone we keep going back to. Mm -hmm. And it's such a, the industry is so IP driven now where they, yep. they feel more confident if they can point to a book or yeah. something. Um, but I, you know, my favorite one was, was Midnight Mass. And, and it, in a lot of ways, was my favorite because uh, it was, it, it was mine. Mm. Um, but uh yeah, I don't know. I, I love them all. I, I'm i just lucky to get to work. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I just love telling stories. So I, if we get to keep doing that, then great. Do you ever see yourself doing like an, an actual series instead of like a limited series? Or do you yeah. like, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah, I think limited series are like novels. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Um, but Midnight Club is designed to be open-ended. Oh, okay. Designed to keep going mm -hmm. if they want it to. Um, the you know the risk with that is they never decide until it's already out so <laughs> you have to figure out how to end it in a way that is lets, both satisfying yeah. and leaves the door open yeah and probably. I I hate that like That's I hate having that life um, <sighs> capitalism I'd love to do an ongoing series I'd love mm -hmm. to it, it, would it, you, so I feel like a criticism and I'm so sorry I've kept you two full hours no, if sure. you need to if you need to bounce please do um uh but oh. Do, I, I've heard criticism. So for Lost is the thing I'm thinking of, of like they did this series and just didn't have an ending in mind for it. Yeah. And so it did what it did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas like, especially in like in the UK, they tend to be like, okay, we're doing this five series, you know, season or whatever. Do you think it is possible to go into, like if you went into a show, would you say, okay, I want to do five seasons of this and this is the storyline of it? Or do you want to say like, here's my pitch for a show. Can I do a few seasons? How many? I, I like to have it mapped out. And mm -hmm. I think that's the difference between Lost and The Wire, you know? Yes, so, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I think it's important to know the size of the story mm -hmm. and, and where you're going and how you keep it going. So you don't have to tread water or, or kind of, Mm -hmm. you break it uh so i i like the british model where it's like this is what it is yeah it's really hard to get people to commit to it in the american marketplace uh, um, oh of course it's it's the the trick is because i've developed shows that are five seasons and mm -hmm. two movies 
you know, mm -hmm. oh yeah, brought, brought that to people and been yeah. like, here's the whole thing. And they're like, well, we'll see how it goes. You know, we'll do one, we'll do a pilot and see how it goes. It's like, well, but there's almost no point in starting this yeah. if we're not going to finish it. Um, and, and so it's dicey. It's, it's, it's a crapshoot. Is having your own production company protection against that kind of like wishy-washy stuff or no? Not really. Cause we, we can't finance anything. Mm. So we can, we can make it, mm -hmm. but if we're doing a series, it's Netflix's money. Gotcha. Um, and they have to say, yes, they have to order the show. So if someday maybe the company is successful enough that we could afford to bankroll our own show, that'd mm -hmm. be awesome. Yeah. Um, but at the moment, I can't at all. And and so, you know, any movie, TV show, I can only do it if someone else agrees to pay for it. And <clears throat> that's a harder ask mm -hmm. as the industry keeps changing. Yeah. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have some projects that are crazy ambitious and would take 10 years to make and, you know, would be a hundred hours of, of stuff mm -hmm. and getting someone to say, yeah, I'll, I'll commit to that is mm -hmm. really hard. Um, and I think they did it. I think about, about when they made Lord of the Rings and committed to that. To all three at all once. Three. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Like how the hell did that happen? And even Peter Jackson would say, that wouldn't happen today. No, no way. So it's, it's, um, the industry has changed so much and is always changing. Yeah. It's hard to do it. So I like limited series because I can say to them, if it doesn't work out, the story's over. Right. Yeah. Uh, You're done with it. Hmm. Yeah. Capitalism is really cool to make art with. <laughs> Capitalism uh, really helps artists. <laughs> they're so diametrically opposed. It's absolutely opposed um over your left shoulder is that a shi piece of the shining carpet yeah it's so this is the um <gasps> oh my god cool i just saw like the little sliver he's showing me the axe and it's framed with the uh with the overlook hotel rug pattern yeah it's and that's, that's the, dope the as hell from the end of dr sleep um i have the i have the carpet that we we rebuilt the hotel uh-huh and I have the carpet in my office. Um, Do you? I've thought about doing an Overlook Hotel carpet somewhere. I just think it'd be so cool. <laughs> it's awesome. It's it's the carpet's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I try to, I keep little mementos from all the movies. Um, I love that carpet. I love to think about things that become iconic, kind of, incidentally. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I I wonder, and you may know. Do you know? Like, did they? pick that carpet like this is a like weird mazy carpet or that's what was in the hotel yeah uh, it's you know it was all part of the bill so they, yeah. they built that that whole interior hmm. someone presented stanley kubrick with a series of carpet options uh-huh and that was one where he went yep um and Good there eye. Of, yeah it's the the carpet in room uh 237 and the carpet in the gold room um are all different and hmm. all equally crazy and cool <laughs> But that one, for whatever reason, just became instant. so iconic. Yeah. And it's the thing when we were trying to recreate it, we couldn't find it anywhere that wasn't kind of like a fan, mm -hmm. you know, like a recreation. Mm -hmm. I don't think it existed before the movie. I think someone just presented a pattern and Kubrick said, yep. <laughs> and print Interesting. It. Yeah. It's a, it's, it is pretty cool. Um, that's look, very I cool. actually got to get going. Oh, you mean two hours is too long to commit to a podcaster you've never met? That's so no, look, rude. This was like... a, a total joy, though, or or I definitely wouldn't have stayed for two hours. <laughs> this um... was so much fun. I, I do want to say, like, I absolutely love your work. I think your work with, like, female characters is incredible and something that we sorely need, in especially in horror. Um Midnight Mass just fucking rules, though. That's the thing. Is Midnight Mass is so fucking good. It's awesome. just a good piece of business. Um, okay. Thank you so much for your time. I cannot thank you enough. This is a very cool opportunity for me. Oh, my dog's here now. Um, <laughs> thank you, sweet girl. This is my dog, Dottie. She's a Hi, goober. Dottie. She's the dumbest dog in existence. Um, anyway, I just revealed I'm also wearing sweatpants. Whoops. Um <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's okay. So am I. Yay! I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah.
professionals. Am I, are you in your like movie theater? I am. This is my little, my little, uh, little tiny movie theater with four seats. So cool. Just for the family. We have, there are five, five of us and four seats. Because I built this, it was before my daughter was born. (laughs) Um, And so I have to figure that out. Um, well, sounds like kids are going to be vying for the spots. Like the yeah. worst kid has to sit on the floor that day. I my thing is I'll, I'll sit on the floor and make sure everybody's got stuff, but I need to figure out how to how to make this right. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it's a tiny, tiny little, uh, little, tiny little home theater in our in our house. But um, but yeah, we look, have this something is, similar. Yeah, uh, it's this has been a total joy. Uh, you have my info. So like, drop me a line. I'll put you in touch with Kate. And I appreciate sure that, that very that. much. Um, wow, Mike, thank you for, for this opportunity. I hope it wasn't, uh, I hope it was somewhat enjoyable. Um, oh, it was a blast. A total blast. Thank so, you. Thanks for the um, great conversation. Oof. Thank you so much for this. Um, it was great meeting you. Um, anything that we, you need to promote plug? Watch all the stuff on Netflix. I don't know. Your shit's more no, popular no, I, than I mine. We, I think we covered it. Um, yeah, but Maybe I, there's look, two I'm just... people who don't have Netflix yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think it's great what you do. So please keep doing it and keep doing it the way that you're doing it, and do everything you can to ignore anybody who tells you otherwise. Um, but you've got a fantastic way of communicating, and it's wonderful that that you're doing this show. So I, I'm grateful to be a part of it and I hope you keep keep at it. So. Thank you so much. I'm not going to cry. I'm a professional. Um, Mike, thank you. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your week and I will be, uh, be in touch. I will let you know when this comes out. Thank you much. <laughs>